Uh, it's going to be a lightning talk. I'm going to cover a lot. What we're going to talk about is a pretty fundamental change for what we're calling for, for Rel Core OS. So I'm going to go fast, but hopefully uh, we'll get there. Um, I'm an engineer on the Core OS team. I've been working on this for a number of years. And um, I like to start every talk by saying why I do what we do, like not just what I'm doing. But you know, a long time ago, I, was, I thought technology had a lot of promise. It was going to change the world in a lot of ways. And it's, it's happened, right? And now our society depends on computers in a lot of ways. As you all know, you have to maintain the computers. You have to keep them up to date and secure. And that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that um, especially with free and open source software, it helps make sure that we control the computers, they're not controlling us um, or being used against us. So yeah, to understand the future, I want to go back a little bit to the past, right? And when we made the transition from OpenShift 3 to 4, as many of you know, I like to say it was a tectonic shift because we acquired CoreOS Tectonic. Um, there's a lot of changes, and it, you know, I didn't, I wasn't involved in some of the fundamental design decisions that were made. Um, for example, the cluster version operator and how we ship OpenShift Core as a container image. And I could talk for this whole rest of the talk about how we built everything up around that, but also, you know, the new opinionated installer and all this, everything that Karina talked about. You know, we kind of, before you can have Kubernetes, you need a Linux, right? And we we took a lot of the Core S technologies and we built all this stuff up on it. And I think, largely speaking, it's been successful. Not that everything's perfect, but we made it work. And you know, I'm very proud of some things, you know, how we use Ignition. And I think it's given us a very cross-cloud experience where you can deploy OpenShift in the same way on bare metal and in public cloud. And at a very technical level, it really works the same way. So we can support it the same way. Um, and of course, we created the OpenShift machine config operator. And for those of you who are maintaining OpenShift, especially on bare metal or where you need to configure things, you've encountered this, right? And this is sort of a key aspect of everything that we've built up for OpenShift in order to make sure that you can click that cluster upgrade button in the console and your operating system will be reliably updated. But it's not just about upgrades. It's also about configuration and control. Right? Because the operating system can feel invisible until something goes wrong. There was a regression in the kernel we shipped that affected just the VMware network driver and made it a lot more flaky. And sorry about that. That one got through our CI just because it was flaky. It didn't totally fail. Um, and that's one of those things where the operating system can feel invisible until something goes wrong like that and takes down your cluster. Right, And that's where you need to be in control. And I like to talk about the machine config operator. Oops, I should have started my timer. Um, someone keep me on track on time. Um, that's where you need to be able to take control, right? And I, I like to think of the machine config operator as um, an, the autopilot you know, on an airplane or a car. But what I'm going to talk about is how you can turn off that autopilot when you need to. Um, so yeah, we invented a lot of stuff. And one of the things that's core to the machine config operator is via this Kubernetes native, uh, a CRD, um, you can change your kernel arguments with kubectl. And the machine config operator takes care of everything else, right? So for example, we ship with hyperthreading enabled, which in some cases, if you want stronger isolation, you do need to turn that off. And we shipped technology such that you can change your kernel arguments with kubectl. And you know, everything, the machine config operator will handle draining and everything else. I think it's cool. It's working well. It means you can commit that CRD to Git. You can do Git ops for your operating system in the same way you do Git ops for all your applications, right? That was something that you just couldn't really do in the OpenShift 3 days. So we've been successful, right? There's a but here. And, and I love to reference this scene. This is, um, this is a screenshot from the movie Jurassic Park. And it was a time when. Um, Movies in the movie theater were real movies and not just regurgitated super, superhero movies. Um, in this scene, she sits down at the system and she says, it's a Unix system. I know this, right? And um, yeah, they're trying to get away from the raptors in this scene, right? And you know, Kubernetes is, I don't know how many years old now, but you know, Unix and Linux have been around for 30 or more years, right? We've built up a lot around Unix before Kubernetes existed, right? So, you know, if she'd sat down then and all she had was kubectl, well, the Raptors would have won, right? Like, we, we've, yeah, there's so much knowledge that 
comes from that Unix base layer that, you know, and let's be honest, we haven't successfully turned that all into a high level CRD um, that you can configure, right? Like, and some of these things um, you just need to manage in a way you did before. Um, you know, for example, you still need to support static IP addresses if you're deploying on bare metal. And that's just a perfect example of, yeah, I've seen some support people say, ah, you shouldn't touch CoreOS, but no, you have to be able to, right? To you need to be able to configure and manage your operating system because it's the foundation for everything else, right? So over the last couple of years, we've navigated a lot of tension in this space, right? Because there's, a, again, there's a lot of tools and techniques to manage Unix systems that haven't fully transitioned to this new world. Um, you know, a big one that you can see in our docs and, and from the support team is should you enable SSH or not, right? And I, I'm suspecting for many of you in this room that may be a dividing line, right? Because the problem is, is it allows uncontrolled change outside of the Kubernetes space, that's in some ways invisible to everything else. It, it means admins are making changes that aren't necessarily captured in your GitOps flow, right? But, but we have so much built up on that, right? Like, if you can SSH to it, it's a Unix system, right? Now, there are people out there that are doing Kubernetes OSs that don't have SSH. And to me, this is a very interesting topic, but you know, we, we're still, we're still a Unix system is the way I like to think about it. Um, and we have a lot of things around, a lot of third parties have made the transition to containerizing their agents. So you can deploy them as privileged daemon sets, you know, security scanners, all that sort of stuff. Some, a good number of organizations have adapted to this new world. But the way I like to think of it, technology goes in layers. Like we're, when Kubernetes appeared, it didn't change the whole world at once, right? There's some organizations that can change at certain speeds. You know, adoption is kind of S-shaped curve. And there's still a lot of, again, tools and techniques that predated this. And um, yeah, third-party agents that we need to support. Um, you know, one, one perfect example of this is uh, the OpenShift SDN team really pushed hard to go back to running Open vSwitch as part of the host because that's how they'd been testing it in other cases. And, we really want it to be a daemon set, um, you know, and it creates, there's different trade-offs in this, right? It's like you need this, in some cases, before Kublet, and so it, we, we feel this tension too, and I'm sure many of you who are administering the OS on OpenShift have, have encountered this. Um, yeah, and obviously still today, like, for a lot of people who are admining systems, you know, switching from the, a sort of Docker-style imperative workflow to Kubernetes is, is still a big leap. So here's the big change. And this was a big change um, in the 412 development cycle so far. I think it's gotten th threatened to be reverted four times because uh, we broke things. No, so I talked about how a release image and the OpenShift CI is very good. You know, we've built everything out around it. So, uh, you know, when we broke things, it was caught. Um, but it's a big change, right? It's this is sort of akin to retuning the jet engine while it's running. So, so the big change is that we're rethinking of RHEL CoreOS as a container base image, okay? So, and what you see here is a Docker file, right? And so we're making it so that you, as a systems administrator, for when something goes wrong, you can write this Docker file, which you already know because you've already seen Docker files for your application, right? You can write this and build a container that derives from RHEL CoreOS. And, and then you can push it to a registry, right? If you're using HyperShift, you can deploy it to multiple clusters, right? You know, um, push it to a centralized registry like Quay, um, mirror it, you can scan it in the same way you scan every container image. But the thing that's new is that you can boot it. So we've taken you know, the OS tree stuff, which is part of RHEL CoreOS, we sort of retooled it, sort of natively understand container images. So again, you build using this Docker file, or really any container native build tooling, and this is turning off autopilot. This is taking control of the OS updates, and the state of the node root file system is this container image you build. So this example wasn't chosen randomly. We had a, a customer that had a big outage because um, they hit a bug in IP tables and 
they rolled out the hotfix um, not perfectly, and it, it caused a lot of confusion. So in this case, uh, let me see if I have this on the next slide. Yes. So here, I'll just skip ahead to this slide. So the idea is once you've built this thing, we're keeping machine config, but the new thing is you can say in the specification, boot this container. And the machine config operator will do the same thing it does for regular OS updates. It'll roll out your custom override to the node root file system. So again, this is in scenarios where you want, so what we're focusing on again right now is just hotfixes, because this is a big change and uh, some of you may be leaping ahead. But this is how you, you take control of the OS updates. So go back real quick. A little bit more information on how we booted. Again, we, what doesn't simply change how you do OS updates? It's, it's been a big change um, because all this, you know, when we need to ship a kernel security update, it needs to work, right? And, and we're, we take this very seriously. So this is a pretty fundamental change in how we ship uh, operating system updates in OpenShift. But now, the, yeah, again, the new container just looks like a native, a native container. But we, it's a seamless upgrade. And in fact, it's going to be mandatory when you upgrade to 4.12. You will, if you're not changing anything, all your machine config will continue to apply. If you've added static IP addresses through um, custom ignition, all that will continue to work. We're going to make this a seamless upgrade, right? Because again, circling back to why I'm here, you need to keep your computer up to date and secure. But this adds a powerful new flexibility and capability in customizing and controlling the RHEL core OS. Um, and something I've been saying a lot is I really, really wish I had a time machine to go back and do this <laughs> instead of, I help create RHEL Atomic Host. And you know, there's a lot, it's a learning experience for us, for you. And I just, I wish we'd done this from the start, but better late than never, right? Um, so yeah, we're gonna make it a seamless transition. We'll give you a lot more power. Um, and yeah, the node root file system, again, is your container. So uh, the, the, the containers that Kublet pulls are still in var, which is life cycled separately. Like, we aren't fundamentally changing that. Yeah, we talked about that. So yeah, we're, we're adding a lot more to the docs on this. Um, and like I said, this, this almost got reverted four times, so it's really going to stick in 4.12, and we're going to ship it, and we're adding a lot, of, um, a lot more built up on this. Um, but just to answer a couple questions in advance. First, one of the most important things is, as soon as you do this, again, it's turning off autopilot. You own updates for that container image. When we ship a kernel security update, you need to rebuild your container when that new image ships, okay? And there's a lot on top of this. Um, but it's targeted at hot fixes for precisely this reason. That's in the case where there's a regression in the kernel NIC driver on vSphere. I want to go back to the earlier kernel. You can do that. You can do that by writing a Docker file or using any tool that looks, yeah, looks familiar to you and deploy it. Um, but a cool aspect of this, right, is that when we ship the fix and you want to go back, you want to turn back on autopilot, you just delete that machine config and the cluster will roll out the stock OS image, right? You've turned back on autopilot, cluster updates are now Life, again, life cycle bound with the operating system. And yeah, again, this doesn't require you to change anything. If, again, if you're using custom ignition, if you're using custom machine config, all of that continues to work. Um, we're just changing how we do things and adding a new capability. But some of you may have leapt ahead here and thought, ah, well, I could use this for something other than hotfixes. I could use this to deploy custom node agents. I could use this to add configuration um, and we have a lot more that we're building on this, and I'm really excited. Um, but I am now over time and out of time, so I will stop, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>